empezar. Aló, aló. Hola a todos y todas. Vamos a empezar nuestra sesión. Ahora voy a llamar a John Brown, que irá, iba a hablar sobre el uso de BGP y URPF para mantener la seguridad de Internet. ¿Puede? Sí, gracias. Adelante. Hola. No, I'm red. was working. Yeah, I like to walk around. <laughs> Solo presentando nuestro speaker de ahora, John Brown trabaja hace muchos años en la parte de tecnologías de internet y está ahora en Citlink. Eh, sí. Eh, va a hablar un poquito sobre la seguridad de Internet. Hey, dos, sí. Solo un momento. Test, test. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Ok, so, mi español muy poquito. But nobody answered to that. How are you this afternoon? That means that lunch still has us sleeping. So, how is everybody? There we go, there we go. Gotta get the blood moving. Do we need to do jumping jacks? No, no, okay, great. I am very honored to be here this afternoon to do a presentation. Um, this presentation uh, is personal for me because uh, Panama is where I was born and raised as a, as a child. So I am back to my home country, as it were. And I want to thank our very kind friends at uh, Latinic and Latinog for uh, graciously having me here today. Over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, we will talk about how we can use uh, our routers to help protect the network and so forth. Um, My presentations have a few ground rules, uh, a few things that I like to make sure that we're, we're clear on. Uh, my very first ground rule, it's very, very important, is number one, ask questions. This is a dynamic environment. We will go through some slides. We will then have hopefully some time for questions. I have made arrangements with a very kind young lady who has the signs to tell me how much time I have left that I can buy more time with, with some more money. I can buy more time. Uh, but it's really important that we ask questions because questions, asking questions is part of the learning process. Um, rule number two is almost as important as rule number one. And rule number two is please make sure that you ask questions because the person sitting next to you probably wants to ask the question but is afraid to. Please don't be afraid to ask questions. We're here to learn, and I want to encourage that, and I would like you all to be able to understand and have a better understanding of how we can use these tools to help protect our network. That's pretty much all my, my rules are. Uh, I will be here for the entire afternoon afterwards. If you want to sit down and discuss more afterwards, that's fine with me as well. A little bit about me. I am based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States. I was born here in Panama. I have a CISSP certification. I'm also an instructor for ISC Squared. I've been pushing packets for a billion years. Uh, at one point, I helped run uh, ICANN's LROOT DNS server for a few years. That was a lot of fun. Um, and we did some innovative things uh, there that you see out today. Uh, throughout the world. For fun, I build and fly airplanes. Whether they're models or full scale that you sit in, uh, I do that for fun. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about how the internet moves traffic around. And by the way, for those of you that have seen my presentations before, 
you know that I hate standing up on a stand and I get out here and I get dynamic and I get involved with my audience. So I will wander. Hopefully the clicker will work. What we're going to talk about a little bit is how, do the, how does the internet work? How do we move traffic around? Have a basic quick understanding of that so that we can then be able to understand how we're going to stop and block traffic. We're going to talk about leveraging BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol. We're going to talk about unicast reverse path forwarding uh, and how we can use that. And we're going to talk about how to do these things at scale and have that hardware dropping function happen, or that packet dropping function happen actually in hardware. And then we have a few example configurations to go over. So let's just take a quick summary and go, how does the internet move traffic around? Well, we use things called routers. And a router forwards packets based on what? The destination address, correct? And so the router is looking at the destination. Where does this packet need to go? It doesn't care where the packet came from. It cares about where does it need to go. So we're going to make forwarding decisions based on the destination address. When we have a large network, we have to be able to communicate these destinations across our router infrastructure. And the way we do that is by using what's known as route advertisement protocols. And so route advertisement protocols, there are two types. There are internal route advertisement protocols, and there are external route advertisement protocols. An internal route advertisement protocol is what you would use inside your organization, inside your university, inside your company, inside your ISP, uh, your hosting company, et cetera. Examples of a route, um, internal route advertisement protocol are things like OSPF, ISIS. RIP was an example. Hopefully nobody is using RIP. And in fact, from a security perspective, I hope everybody makes sure that their routers are explicitly turning RIP off on all of their interfaces. There are many devices out there today that have RIP enabled automatically, and we don't think about it because we don't use it anymore. But hackers can send RIP packets from their servers that they're hosting on your network, and maybe that will infect or uh, affect how your router routes traffic. We, so OSPF, ISIS, Today, on the external world, we use BGP, BGP version 4. So you have these different places where route information can come in. What does a router do with it? Each of these routing protocols goes into what's known as a RIB, R-I-B, which is the router information base. Think of this as a database of routes that the router is going to use to figure out how to get packets to their destination. The rib is distilled. It's, it's, it's worked. It, magic happens, and it turns into what's called the FIB, or the forwarding information base. And the FIB, F-I-B, the FIB is what is used ultimately by the router to make a forwarding decision. Again, based on that destination, right? So if we can control the rib, and we can control the FIB, we can control what happens to packets in our network. We'll take a sidestep there for one second. This is one of the reasons why malicious actors really care about getting into your router and compromising your router because they want to get to that fib. They want to be able to control where a packet that should be going to PayPal mm -hmm. is really going somewhere else. Okay. And if they can control that by a router, then they are being able to do that outside of your virus scanner, right? If the virus scanner is on the desktop, but we're controlling the packets over here on the router at the house, or the router in a small business, and we're sending it somewhere malicious, then we have the ability to affect traffic and the user wouldn't ever know. Lucy? Yes, I'm going to call on you for a second. 
What is, what's the name of the paper, the equipment, the CPE paper? Is there, a, is there a formal name for it? Okay, that was a big mouthful, right? So Lucy Mara and a whole bunch of really qualified other people around the world worked on a document about what should customer premise equipment do or not do. And I'm sure it's fairly easily accessible. If not, I'll make sure I put it up on, on a notes that I'll put up later about it. But that's a document that says this is what CPE should or shouldn't do. And one of those things is, is we want to make sure we protect the routing information table and the FIB so that we don't get packets that get redirected. So let's talk about what kinds of packets we want to stop. Source spoofed. What is a source spoofed packet? Who wants to answer that? Nobody? Aw, okay. We need some coffee, I think. Source spoof addressing is the falsification of the source address, right? It is faking the source IP address. And why would we want to do that? We want to be able to make somebody think that the, that the attack is coming from somewhere else. Maybe if we're using an amplification attack like DNS amplification or NTP amplification attack, that source IP address is actually our victim. So if I'm the bad actor and the source address is Natalia? No. Yes. Natalia here, then I send the DNS query to the Lucy Mara DNS server. She sends her reply over here because she thinks that's where it came from because it's a source spoofed address. Works really well for UDP-based protocols. When do we know that a packet is faked, the source address is faked? We certainly know it when the packet comes into our network. At that point of ingestation or ingress into our network, we know that that IP address could be faked, right? Because if my subscriber sits there and sends a packet out with a fake IP address that's not their desktop, not their local area network, or not the public IP address that they're NATed to, then we know that it is faked. And so that's a great place to be able to stop source address. Well, we thought about this 20 years ago. An Internet Engineering Task Force, best in current practice number 38, addressed this nearly 20 years ago. And I keep stressing nearly 20 years ago because 20 years later, we are still really bad at preventing source spoofed packets from entering our network. And that's something we as network operators need to change desperately. We need better network hygiene. We need to have cleaner, less stinky networks. Manners is a great document. How many of you know what Manners is? OK, got to get more hands. You guys got to go read what Manners is. Go Google it while I'm talking at you, right? Go Google it. Read it. If it's something you believe your network should be part of, you should join. Because Manners, just like table manners, tells you and helps talk about how service providers should work together in being able to share and interconnect and how their networks and routers should work. What else do we want to filter? We want to filter botnets. We want to filter C2, command and control. We may want to filter other things. We may get intelligence from our own network. How many of you run VoIP in your network? Okay. How many of you have seen SIP vicious? Viciously attacking, trying to find and hack into your VoIP network, right? Okay. Well, if you know that there are IP addresses that are constantly scanning your network and you have, let's say, a VoIP honeypot, you could take those source addresses and use those as something that you might want to block. And I will show you in this presentation how you might be able to do that. You might want to be able to block data for Spam, IP addresses of email servers that constantly spam you. Why worry about having Spam Assassin or one of the anti-spam tools process the message? If you know you never want email from a particular IP address, just drop it. 
IP reputation, you know, is this a good IP? Is this a bad IP? You can get IP reputation feeds from various organizations. Two organizations that I do some work with are up on the screen, Team Cymru. How many of you have heard of Team Cymru? Okay. So just as a quick note for those of you that have not heard about Team Cymru, how many of you are planning to come next year to the Latinic Nat Latinog in Colombia? Okay, great. You'll learn a lot more about Team Cymru there because they're going to be helping co-sponsor, co-host uh, the meeting at that point. Team Cymru is a great security organization. They have a lot of data, and they can tell you a lot about your network, and a lot of the data they have is available for free. Yes, I did say free. If you're willing to share and work with them, they're willing to work and share with you as a network operator. <laughs> you can use their IP reputation data to turn around and drop traffic either going to or from a command and control environment. Cisco's Talos group also has IP reputation data available, and you can work with them. There are lots of others, including your own internal data that you might have. Well, how do we block bad traffic, and how do we do it at scale? Because when we're dealing with millions of packets per second, we've got to be able to do it fast, efficiently, and without mistakes. How many people in this room are an ISP or a hosting company? Okay. How many of you are educational networks? And what about commercial? Let's see. Is there, is there end, end commercial or enterprise networks in here or governmental networks? Okay. So mostly ISPs, mostly hosting, and then uh, educational networks. So that means you guys have networks that are fairly large. You have multiple routers, you have multiple switches, you have multiple points of presence across your service area region. So how do we prevent source spoofed packets from coming into our network? We can write access control lists. We can put these access control lists on each of our interfaces, right? I know that, that packets coming from Lucy Mara can only be coming from Lucy Mara and so if all of a sudden I'm getting a packet that says Giacomo on it, coming down the interface from Lucy Mara, it's probably fake, right? So now I, have to, I can build a rule that drops all the Giacomo packets because, well, we know it's not Giacomo. We know it's Lucy Mara. It's supposed to be only those packets coming down the interface. But this is a problem because in order to do this, we have to do this on each and every interface across our network and each and every network interface becomes, is different configured. So it's not very easy and it's very prone to errors. How do we drop traffic to a DDoS victim? Again, we can write access control lists. We can sit there and put those on our routers, but if we have multiple peering sessions, we have multiple transit sessions, we need to now put those filters on all of those different interfaces. Again, we have the same kinds of issues. It's not easy to maintain. It's prone to mistakes. And we have to put them on each of our interfaces. Clearly, there must be a better way. And again, the same thing with botnets and C2. And yes, these last three slides are repetitive because mostly the steps are the same that we would have to be able to do on our network. So how do we make it easier? How do we make it work better? There has to be a better way. Destination-based filtering and source-based filtering. So let's talk about destination-based filtering. And this is where we're going to start to get a little bit more into the, the technical meats of how things work. Reminder, again, packets make, routers make forwarding decisions based on the destination and based on that destination information being in the FIB, in the forwarding information base. If we have the ability to put a bad IP address or bad prefix in the forwarding information base of our router, do we not now control how a packet gets to that bad interface, that bad address, right? We have the ability to drop that traffic. 
because if we set the next hop of that route in our router table to black hole or to dev null, we cause the router to drop the traffic. All right? We can also do something else that's kind of fun. We could set next hop to be a port over here that's our sniffer port, where we might be running something like bro, or we might have some sort of PCAP happening or something else, where we know we want to see any packet that is coming into our network from a customer that might be going to a C2, we want to redirect it over here to some sort of a sniffer to see what's happening and be able to packet capture or have some sort of indication that there's been a problem or that you know our customer might have been just clicked on a piece of malware. We can use BGP to inject that route into our router. And if we use BGP to inject that route into our router, then we're able to have that redistribute that, uh, that announcement across all of our routers quickly. So we can inject a bad route, but then we need to put a tag on it. We need to put a little label on it. And in BGP, we call that a community string. So we put a community string or a tag on the route that says bad IP. Now, every one of our BGP routers that receives this route with this tag that says bad IP knows that it needs to forward all traffic to the black hole, to dev null. So it sets the next hop to dev null, which is discard. It discards those packets. Thus, all the routers are going to drop that traffic, and this is all being done in hardware. So the load on your router or route engine CPU is very low because it's happening at hardware, or as the vendors like to say, at line rate. Okay? You make arrangements with your transit provider. So Klaus is my transit provider. Hello, Klaus. And he's a very big network in Brazil, right? And he and I are going to make an arrangement that if I send him a BGP announcement of an IP address, let's say 1.2.3.4 slash 32, and I have a community string on it that says bad IP, what Klaus is going to do is in his network, all traffic going to that IP address, he's going to drop. Why would I want to do that? Anybody? Why would I want my upstream provider to drop traffic? To protect against a DDoS, right? Lucy Mara's website is being attacked like crazy. Her website is on my network. My upstream provider, Klaus, I'm telling him, please drop traffic to Lucy Mara's IP address. And the benefit of that is, is all of that traffic coming down that interface doesn't come down the interface to me anymore. The transit provider, Klaus, stops that upstream. Okay? Many service providers today allow you to do RTBH, or remote trigger black hole, where you can build a special BGP session to tell your upstream provider to drop traffic to specific IP addresses. And they're dropping it in hardware. And it saves your network. We can take that idea and expand it a little bit more. And we can go use a free service from Team Cymru called Utters. You are, let's see, uh, unwanted traffic removal service. Yeah, UTRS. It's a free service from, from Team Cymru. You can join it. You validate your IP addresses. And then what happens is I can send an announcement via BGP to Utters and say, please drop traffic going to this IP. And all of the members of Utters will drop traffic going to that particular IP. So if you're under attack, now all of a sudden you've got a much larger ability to drop traffic to that attacked IP address and potentially save the rest of your network. 
There's really cool things you can do with remote trigger black hole, whether it's internal to your network or with your peers or with your transit providers. How do we prevent source spoofing? As I mentioned earlier, IETS Best and Current Practice 38 talked about it. And the best way that we do this is by using technology called URPF. Unicast reverse path forwarding. How many of you today have URPF enabled or configured in your network? I see one hand. I'll put mine up too. That makes it two hands. Come on, guys and gals. OK, three hands. We're getting there. Four hands. All right. Do I hear five? Five. Going once, going once, going twice, going twice. Sold to the man over there for five. Just kidding. Just trying to get you guys awake. URPF, as defined in RFC 3704, is designed to, imp to minimize the impact of a distributed denial of service attack by denying access to the network of source spoofed packets. URPF has been around forever, like 20 years. Some Cisco devices allow you to do URPF on a per interface basis. Some Cisco devices require you to do it on a chassis basis. Juniper devices, the MX uh, series, that's what I use mostly. Um, the MX series allow us to do unicast reverse path forwarding on a per interface basis. Microtik routers do it on a per chassis or on a per router basis, so you have to be careful there. How does URPF work? Again, routers are making decisions based on destination. When we enable URPF, we are now asking the router to make a decision based on the source IP address. Okay? And this is where I'm going to make the cameraman really crazy because I'm going to start getting really active and using people. My apologies. So URPF works based on looking at the source address. And so let's talk about how that works. Let's see who my current uh, victim is. And you are, sir. Jordy. Jordy, pleasure to meet you. So Jordy here is a customer. I am his internet service provider. We have a link. Maybe it's a DSL link. Maybe it's a fiber link. Maybe it's a wireless link. But we have a link between us. On my side, as his ISP, I am going to configure URPF strict mode, there are two modes, strict and loose. We'll talk about strict first. So Jordy and I have our interface, we're configured, we're up and running. I have strict mode defined on my side. Jordy IP address is normally 1.2.3.4 slash 32. When he sends me a packet in the source IP the source part of the IP uh, frame, it's going to have what? 1.2.3.4, right? Because that's his source address. In my FIB, in my forwarding information base, I also have 1.2.3.4. And where do I have next hop set for that? I have next hop set towards Jordy, right? Because if I want to send a packet to Jordy, I'm going to go down the interface that's going towards Jordy. So this is what URPF will do. I receive the packet from Jordy. I look at the source address. And I make a determination, is that source address in my FIB, forwarding information base? And if it is in the FIB, is the next hop, is the interface where it's going to go, the interface that the packet just came from? Right? So packet comes in from Jordy. I check my routing table. If I was going to send a packet to Jordy, would it go down the same place that the packet just came from? If the answer is yes, forward the packet and keep on going. If the answer is no, what do I do with it? I drop it. I discard it. Right? So now Jordy has a 14-year-old son who has just sat down 
and has figured out how to run Python on Linux on his computer. And he's really getting smart about this, right? His sister is telling him not to do this, but he's a 14-year-old boy, so you know what's going to happen. So now, Jordy's 14-year-old son turns around and sends me a packet with a source IP address of 4.3.2.1, because he's trying to spoof, right? He's trying to get his buddy down the street knocked off World of Warcraft because he's trying to get his, his ping times. He's trying to flood him. What do I do? I see that the source address is 4.3.2.1. I drop. I drop in hardware. I'm not burning CPU cycles for that drop, okay? So I'm able to discard. This is strict mode. And you should look at configuring URPF strict mode on single homed interfaces that face a customer. And I will tell you that you'll see in some other slides here in a moment, danger, danger, danger. Test this in the lab first. Make sure you understand what's happening with your equipment and your network. Don't send me an email next week saying, John, I did what you said in that class and my network blew up. Make sure you test it in a lab, right? So now let's talk about loose mode, okay? Loose is a little bit different than strict. In loose mode, the packet comes from Jordy. I look in my routing table to see if that address exists at all in my routing table. And if it does exist in my routing table, I forward it. If it does exist in my routing table, but the next hop is null, or discard, or black hole, depending on how your device calls it, then I drop it. So how do we use unicast reverse path forwarding loose feature? Right? So loose has some really interesting attributes. If I inject a route into the routing table, and I set the next hop to discard, then that means that the router is going to go ahead and discard that packet. So back to my example with Jordy and his 14-year-old son. He now sends me a packet that is going towards a command and control server for, for malware. If I have the IP address of that command and control server in my router, routing table, with the destination being discard, the next top of being discard, what's going to happen? I'm going to discard it, right? So that means that Jordy's son's computer that was hacked is not going to be able to talk to that command and control bot network. It's not going to be able to talk to that C2, right? That's based on packets coming into the network. I'm going to discard the destination. But what happens when I have a packet coming from the command and control bot trying to go back to Jordy? The source of that command and control bot is the C2. I'm going to discard, right? Filtering spoof, again, test this in a lab, right? You want to be able to um, make sure that you discard source spoof traffic. And I've just been told I've got only five minutes left. You sure? I thought we started at 2.15. I had 45 minutes. I think we have more like 10 minutes left. Hmm, okay. <clears throat> Test lab. Enabling URPF strict mode will allow you to help protect your network from source spoofed packets coming in from your edge subscribers. How do we inject bad prefixes into the network? We can use BGP. We need to be able to have it easily configurable and it needs to be easily adjustable in real time. The very kind folks at RIPE NCC had some folks create a tool called ExaBGP. It's free. It's on GitHub. It will run on a Linux VM 
for example, I have an ExaBGP daemon that's running on a digital ocean droplet, so it's outside of my network, and I can use that to tell people to do things about my network. So I can drop traffic, even if my network is really b bashed up and is really getting attacked, I can log in to my digital ocean droplet and can, can tell it to drop traffic that might be uh, my victim and be able to control my network that way. Obviously, there's some security considerations around that. The other cool thing about XABGP is it supports the ability to send it text or JSON feeds, so the ability to script and automate is pretty cool. Like I said, caution, caution. You must not redistribute IP addresses that you have put into your BGP table and labeled as a bad IP. You must not redistribute these to a peer or a transit provider unless you explicitly actually know what you're doing. So please filter. Otherwise, you can cause problems out on the net. Because when you inject an IP address that's bad into your BGP, are you not, in some extent, doing a little bit of IP address hijacking, route hijacking, inside your own network? So think about that and make sure that you properly filter that. Let's take a look at some example configs. So here's a Juniper router config. The ability to, I think I have a pointer on here. Yep. So I have my interface. RPF check, mode loose, it's pretty much all I need to do on that Juniper. Make sure you check your Juniper configs to see if there's anything specific that you need to do. It's that easy. So now let's look at our Juniper router configuration using ExaBGP neighbor, right? So I have a, a BGP session, I bring it up, I have my neighbor, and down here I have this special magic line, accept remote next hop. In other words, do not change the next hop address. Take the next hop address as I'm advertising it to the Juniper. And so here's the exit BGP route announcement. I'm going to route 45.35.208.226.32. I'm setting the next hop to 192.0.2.1. Quick test. Is 192.0.2.1, is that a publicly routable IP address? No. It's one of the RFCs that's used for private IP space for documentation. I'm setting the local preference to 5,000. I want my local preference on this route to be really, really high. And the reason I want the local preference to be really, really high is I want to make sure that the router picks this route, right? And so you'll also notice that I have set a community tag. So I have a string here that says 65,001 colon 666. This is a, almost an accepted uh, bad IP community tag. And then I have another tag on here that an has an internal meeting in my network. So I send this via exit BGP to my Juniper router. And if we look at the Juniper router, this is how the Juniper router puts the route into the FIB. Here's the, here's the IP address, the destination, right? Local preference is 5,000, right? And I have it set to discard. That means that in this particular Juniper router, Anything going to 45.35.208.226 slash 32 is going to get dropped on the floor. It also means, because I've used URPF, anything that came from that IP address, the source, is also going to get dropped on the floor. So with one entry in my routing table, I am now controlling what happens to packets that go either to this IP or packets that came from this IP, and I'm discarding both ways. In effect, I have cut the flow of communications both in and out of my network to this IP address. If I do this with C2, if I do this with a botnet, 
then that botnet and that C2 is not going to be able to communicate inbound and it's not going to be able to communicate outbound. So victims that have been infected are not going to be able to reach the C2 and the C2 is not going to be able to reach victims. One entry, one configuration, small configuration change, and I've done multiple things. So we had a DDoS a few months ago where we had over 40,000 spoofed source IPs being reflected off of a set of public DNS servers. And we needed to be able to drop those traffic. So we took those 40,000 IPs and we turned around and we built a little script and we injected them into our router in BGP and that's the CPU over the course of a day from doing that. In other words, it really didn't have that much impact on our CPU. But we were able to basically drop all the malicious traffic that was coming in. I think we're getting closer to actually my time being expired here. Um, in summary, there are open source tools like ExaBGP. There are open uh, technologies that have been around for a long time, like URPF. We can leverage and use these tools to do simple routing tricks in our routers to go ahead and enable and help clean up our networks. If we use IP reputation feeds that we either create internally or we get through a third party, we can use that to also drop traffic from our network. At the same time, we are enabling the ability to reduce or eliminate source spoof. I personally believe that if we were able to get rid of source spoof addressing, amplification attacks like DNS amplification and NTP amplification, those kinds of DDoS attacks would virtually disappear. Because if we don't have the ability to spoof, we don't have the ability to execute those attacks as easily. What we have shown today is that we have the ability to use some technology that already exists to drop traffic based on both the source and or the destination address. I will leave you with this thought. Each of us as an internet network operator has a responsibility to making sure that we run our networks as best we can, right? Jordy, who is a network operator probably, I am trusting that he's going to run his network as best as possible because I don't want his network attacking my network either with knowledge or accidentally because his customers. And more importantly, he doesn't want my network being the source of problems into his network. Each of us are competitors, but we also have a joint responsibility to make sure that our networks run clean. Read BCP38, read the relevant RFCs, and implement that as accordingly and as needed within your network. It's not that hard. Look at Manners. Manners is a great effort by a bunch of really cool people to help make the relationships between us and routers work better and have a more stable environment. When you're doing BGP with your customers, Make sure that you actually are vetting their IP addresses. Are you looking them up? Are you using the tools that Latinic has, that RIPE has, that APNIC has, that AFRNIC has, that a uh, Aaron have to validate those addresses? To make sure that your customer who's telling you that they really own 4.0.0.0 slash 8, really, I own it, trust me. Do they really? And are you supposed to be announcing that route or allowing them to announce it? We all have a responsibility to do that. Some resources, you can get to XWBGP via GitHub, Utters, uh, the unwanted traffic removal system from Team Cymru, the Bogon announcements from Team Cymru, uh, controller reputation feeds also from Team Cymru, are some things up there to take a look at. And I have no idea if we have time for questions or not, but I'm available for questions. Anybody? Does anybody have any questions? Uh, we have one person heading towards the mic.
Thank you, John. Yep. Any questions? Yeah, one question. One if you question. go to a, find a mic. Please, Douglas. Uh, a question about the, the time being, I, I had already done this question with, to you in 2018, but the question is about the time that you keep those bad address uh, announced to your network, because uh, we are developing a project that redistribute that bad address to everybody that wants to know it, but uh, we are having problem with false, false positives and things like that, or bad address that were bad address got, got clean and things like that. So great question. So I take bad addresses that we create or, or decide are bad internally, I put them into an SQL database, and I, I use that database to generate what goes into my ExaBGP feed. The question is, how long do I keep that bad address in my database, and how long do I keep injecting it into my network? What I've basically decided to do is to build sort of a simple little scale. If you, if you smack me once, if you hit me once, I'm going to not talk to you for an hour. If you hit me again in that hour, I'm not going to talk to you for four hours. If you keep hitting me, I'm not going to talk to you for a day. If you keep hitting me, don't worry, I don't ever need to talk to you again until you give me a good reason. So basically, I build sort of an exponential scale of how long I keep uh, items in. If I keep seeing the same IP address being problematic, then I keep it in my database longer and longer. Do I run the risk of false positives? Yes, but I haven't had any. I've actually had false positives from other reputational feeds, and so that's where I've pared down where, where I get my reputation feeds from because they may not clean up as quickly as I would like them to. The other thing you have to do is you have to, if you're going to maintain a database of bad IPs, you have to make sure that an attacker doesn't discover that and then use that against you, right? Because if I'm on a network in... Belgrade, just to pick something out of the middle of nowhere, um, and I turn around and that ISP is allowing source spoofed, and I put an IP address in there of Google's uh, website, and I keep attacking with that as the source address, then I might turn around and drop traffic from that, and because it's from Google. So I have a whitelist that I go through that I wash IPs through to make sure that large infrastructure providers like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, others aren't accidentally getting dropped, or if they are going to get dropped, that that becomes a human intervention to say, yes, we're going to go ahead and drop that. So it's, it's, it, the, the answer to the question is, how long do you keep it in your database is really up to your network and your circumstances. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank Any you other questions? All right. Your presentation are very inspiring. Thank you. But Have a great day. Now, vamos ir para.